Okay, shall we start? Yes. Welcome to ICE Forum. Thank you very much for joining us today. I'm Aloisio from Aloisio Kim Jong Hwa, working for IOFM JPS Committee, you know, the Catholic priest and then Franciscan brothers in South Korea, and also working for the ICE Network as one of the co representatives. This year marks the 30th anniversary of the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change since it was established in 1992. This means the world government have talked in order to respond to the climate crisis for the past 30 years. However, the government didn't make significant progress enough to limit the global average temperature rise to 1.5 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels with all the nationally determined place for carbon dioxide reduction submitted by the government just before the COP26 last year. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, good. The temperature is expected to rise 2.4 degrees Celsius. We also have other problems for climate finance to support the developing countries. As one of the important actors, faith-based organization and religious people have played active role in the COPs for three decades and recently increasingly to join the global climate talks. So that is why we religious people are here today. I hope we can gather wisdom from the forum to get through this challenging issue. Before we start the forum, let's hear a welcoming address from the standing representative of the ICE network, Reverend Lee jung Bae. Is speaking in Korean. Please select the English button mm -hmm. on interpretation. Mm -hmm. Please welcome Reverend Lee Jung Bae. Clap your hands. Yes. Uh, 여러분들을 만나서 반갑습니다. 지금 한국은 uh, 신년 음력으로 새로운 한 해를 맞는 축 축제가 시작되는 절기입니다. 동시에 축제가 있지만 동시에 이 축제를 통해서 코로나 바이러스가 새롭게 엄청나게 퍼져나가지 않을까 그렇게 걱정하는 시점이기도 합니다. 이런 좋은 뭐 좋기도 하고 또 걱정도 있는 이런 때에 아주 적절한 주제를 가지고 우리가 함께 모였습니다. 코로나 바이러스는 기후 붕괴와 그리고 불평등의 문제를 우리에게 적실하게 깨우쳐 주었습니다. 기후 문제와 불평등의 문제가 서로 너무나 깊게 관련되어 있음도 알게 되었습니다. 뭔가 새로운 체제가 요구되지 않으면 지금 상태로는 지속할 수 없는 문명이라고들 말하고 있습니다. 사실 우리가 속해 있는 모든 종교는 자연이라고 하는 어떤 토대가 없이는 생겨날 수 없는 그런 것이었습니다. 자연이 없는 종교는 존재할 수가 없는 것이죠. 자신들이 처한 풍토 속에서 각자 고유한 종교들이 생겨났고 그로 인해서 서로 차이가 있지만 그래도 자연을 지키는 공통의 과제가 생겨난 것입니다. 이런 상황 속에서 새로운 체제가 요청되는 현실에서 자연을 살리고 또 불평등의 문제를 극복하고 하는 이러한 시점에서 우리 종교가 과연 어떤 역할을 할수 있겠는가 또 남반구에 있는 종교와 북반구에 있는 종교는 각각 자기들이 처한 현실에서 어떤 이야기를 해야 오를까 또 서로 서로의 서로가 서로에게 어떤 말들
만나서 반갑습니다. 고맙습니다. Thank you very much, Lee j o n g b e for the welcoming address. Something his voice is uh, something noisy, but uh, we can uh, catch out his uh, message from here. So now let me introduce today's moderate Emily Parry. Emily is a founder of a Root Breeze Ecosystems, a facilitation and curated strategic support platform <clears throat> for local grassroots, indigenous, faith-based and indigenous initiatives that contribute to healthy social ecosystems with a focus on diverse eco-cultural approaches to climate action, social harmony, peace, and well-being. She completed a doctoral level research degree at the University of Oxford Center for the Environment School of Geography and the Environment seated within the Environmental Change Institute. She has uh, recently worked as a research fellow for Stockholm Environment Institute in the climate change disasters and humanitarian research cluster in Oxford and Bangkok. As an associate fellow for Oxford Climate Policy. In 2018 and 2019, she is a distinguished fellow with the Schumacher Institute in the UK and the Human AI Fellow at the East West Center. Lastly, she's an advisor to the ICE Network. Emily has done lots of work. I can calculate his <laughs> ability and then something levels. So her bio is very long. So I cut down, cut some parts, Emily. Very sorry for you. And then I hope you will understand this. Now we are going to have our moderate. Please welcome Emily. Kamera, thank you, Brother Kim. And um, in the future, I think maybe all we should say is this is Emily. <laughs> We'll keep it simple in introduction. Um, before we begin our program today with the panel, I would like to invite uh, Bishop Philip Huggins to lead us in an interfaith moment of prayer and meditation. Thank you, Emily. So let's be still where we are. Close our eyes. Be attentive. to our breathing, breathing out, breathing in, each breath in the gift of life. And as we settle into this important time together, let's first remember the day, perhaps the night, Before this moment, people we may have met, expected and unexpected, glimpses of creation, in my case, sudden rain, ants finding shelter, birds in the trees, a fresh smell, the other side of rain ceasing. Let us pray and meditate for any whom we carry particularly in our hearts at this moment and for their well-being. and attentive to this moment. Let us pray and meditate according to our tradition. 
for inspiration, illumination in our conversation, in our relating to one another. And as we now prepare for our conversation, let's slowly open our eyes and look at the faces on our screen, keeping the silence and just appreciating that we are here now together in faith and looking to be beneficial towards our planetary life, our souls, each other. Let's open our eyes and take in the beauty of each who shares this moment with us. Thank you, Bishop Huggins. So thank you so much, everyone who has helped open up this ICE Network program. Um, while we have had many activities and communications in parts and pieces across our networks and our affiliates, our Kalyana Mitra, all of our friends together, since the COVID lockdown, it feels that we've all been a little bit um, quiet and figuring out how we are making our way through. And this, this, this gathering today um, feels very joyful in our reunification of um, our, our focus and our consideration of who we are together um, in our interfaith engagement around climate change and the global ecological crisis. Uh, so I'm very honored and humbled to be here as a moderator and to present our four panelists today. And um, uh, which I will introduce them shortly, um, but also to um, give you a brief overview of our program. We will be um, speaking among the panelists for about 30 minutes. And then in the second portion of our program, um, we will be certain to open up so that all of the participants who've gathered here today can share their own experiences and comments and questions with the panelists. And we can have a discussion together then. And then within the third portion, we will take some time to contemplate um, some questions about um, who we need to be together in our interfaith alliances and our networks as we engage um, with the climate crisis and we navigate pathways for caring for each other and caring for all beings. So thank you everybody for being here today. I'm very, very pleased. Um, so I'd like to start with an introduction of our panelists. Um, the first, and if you can wave when I introduce you, will be Budi Tijano, who is with the Franciscan Network, um, both from uh, hailing from Indonesia and Geneva. Uh, he's the Asia Pacific Program Coordinator um, with the Franciscan Network. He has over 15 years of experience in human rights advocacy, both in the United Nations and working across various countries and communities. He is um, also the Deputy Advo um, Advocacy Director at Franciscans International. Um, prior to his current position, he served as the Secretary General of the International Catholic Center of Geneva and worked with the International Catholic Movement for Intellectual and Cultural Affairs in Geneva and with the International Movement of Catholic Students of Paris. Uh, Mr. Tijano has held academic positions at the Sanata Dharma University in Indonesia and Monash University in Australia. 
um, and he has published extensively on the impact of climate change and of natural resource extraction um, and that impact on human rights, as well as on human rights of refugees and asylum seekers in the Asia Pacific region. Thank you very much and welcome, Budi. We're so happy to have you today. Um, I'd also like to introduce Jill Jameson with the International Network of Engaged Buddhists and the Buddhist Peace Fellowship Australia. Um, welcome, Jill. Um, Jill is a lifelong peace activist. She has been practicing Zen Buddhism for over 20 years as a student of Aiken Broshi and other teachers in the Diamond Sangha. She has been working with local communities in Asia and community development and as a trainer at peace building and leadership um, training skills, drawing on Buddhist principles and practice and with a commitment to active nonviolence and interfaith dialogue. Jill is an engaged Buddhist and a founding member of the Buddhist Peace Fellowship Melbourne chapter. She's on the executive committee of the International Network of Engaged Buddhists. And in this capacity, she has also worked previously with the Women and Gender Subcommittee of INEB and has worked with others to improve the situation of Buddhist nuns in Asia. Um, and she is also um, a member of the Dharma Gaya Trust and supportive projects in Asia, which bring the Dharma and ecology together. Um, so welcome, Jill. We're very pleased to have you. And as um, many are dealing with um, in our current global pandemic, Jill is present here in spite of COVID. And we are grateful for her. And we also want to allow space if there needs to be some coughing or water drinking or resting along the way. So we're so pleased you're here. Thank you, Jill. Um, I would also like to introduce Bishop Philip Hugg Huggins, whom you've heard from in the opening prayer. He is with the Anglican Bishop and President of the, and the Church of Australia and the President of the National, National Council of Churches in Australia. Um, Philip is also the Director of the Center for Ecumenical Studies at the Australian Center for Christianity and Culture. And in that capacity, he has facilitated meetings with the Australia's ambassador for the environment as regards preventing climate change. In climate action, Philip has participated in the COP25 as a member of the World Council of Churches delegation. And since that time, he has been working within COP26 um, for that success and has been the International Liaison Committee, um, working through, pardon me, the International Liaison Committee to the UNFCCC. Welcome, Philip. Thank you. Finally, our fourth panel, uh, panelist I would like to introduce, and if you could raise your hand when I introduce you, is Dr. Rashid Al Mahoud Titumir. Um, welcome. Um, Dr. Titumir is the chair of the Bangladeshi National Committee um, for the IUCN members in Asia, as well as the as um, well as chair and professor and chairman for the Department of Development Studies at the University of Dhaka. He has provided advisory services to UN uh, to governments on multilateral negotiations, um, such as UN DESA, WTO, UNFCCC, UNCBD, and UNSCAP. Um, Dr. Pardon me. Um, Dr. Tichmir has worked in diverse constituencies, academia, governments, think tanks, international organizations, and media, and he's engaged in research for pioneering approaches for development public policies and innovative solutions um, in communities. So welcome, Dr. Titimo. I'm very pleased to have you all here with us today. Um, and I would like to start with our discussion. Um, and I invite each of you, should in the discussion questions come up or you would like to take it into a different space to, to do so, we'd like this to be fluid, dynamic, and responsive. Um, so Budi, I'd like to start with you. Um, it'd be very helpful to hear from you about the work that you have been doing with the Franciscans um, strategically and um, directly within the UNFCCC or within facilitative spaces that may impact climate policy. Um, examples of your work and the work of the Franciscans. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Emily. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm very happy and honored to be part of the discussion. 
And I think this discussion is very timely as now we are, as uh, the Reverend mentioned that we are in difficult time, but at the same time, we are people of faith and of hope that we can try to work together to bring hope so that we can address one of the biggest challenges uh, in the humanity, that is the climate change. So Franciscan International is uh, the NGO of the Franciscan families. As, uh, we have brother Aloy who started, uh, who opened this uh, event, and we are working together with different uh, faith constituencies, but also human rights uh, organizations. So what we are doing in terms of uh, climate change, first of all, of, of course, we are trying to listen to the cry of the people, try to hear uh, the concerns of our constituencies uh, in different parts of the world. The Franciscans work with the uh, communities in Solomon Island, in Papua New Guinea, in Madagascar, uh, in uh, Italy, in Switzerland, in different parts of the world. We listen to them. And after that, we try to bring their concerns into different uh, uh, international fora be it in the fora of uh, climate change negotiations or be it in the human rights or uh, uh, fora. What we are trying to uh, really push is to be the bridge of uh, uh, the testimonies, the experience of the people at the grassroots level to be heard at the decision-making uh, process. Uh, we are trying also to really push uh, the decision-making process at the international level to be coherent. They, they need to be coherent as people, but as also the decision makers. Uh, they have to be coherent as well as uh, uh, those who have the mandate from the government, but at the same time, they are uh, the caretaker of uh, the planet as well. So that's why uh, during uh, the COP26, for example, uh, Bishop uh, uh, Philip has been part of our network in trying really to push uh, the negotiators to listen to their uh, own uh, spirituality, to their own uh, uh, being as a person, but at the same time to be coherent so that when they negotiate, when they make decisions, they have to be uh, responsible as well to that decisions. So for example, um, when we were in Glasgow, we met with uh, the delegations of Solomon Islands. Uh, we worked a lot with the Anglican Franciscans. So I'm very happy that uh, our brother uh, Philip, who is an Anglican bishop, is here. Uh, we worked very closely with the Anglican uh, community in uh, Solomon Island who are affected directly because of the climate change. So when we uh, met with the uh, delegation of Solomon Island in COP26, we uh, brought the concerns of our Anglican communities, Catholic communities in Solomon Island, so that when they negotiate uh, uh, in Glasgow, they listen also to this kind of uh, experience and testimonies. And at the same time, we also work at the UN Human Rights Council in Geneva, so that when we talk about the uh, issue of climate change, we should also bring the human rights aspect. So we try to be coherent in uh, reminding people to be coherent in different aspects of uh, each person, so that finally we can take the responsibility together in addressing this uh, climate crisis. Thank you. Thank you so much, Budi. That's very helpful to kind of start thinking about the process. And I appreciated how uh, your faith-based engagement around climate change immediately is interfaith and inclusive and uh, considering the whole being, um, particularly the note that you raised about working with climate negotiators within the climate talks and that potential tension of being um, a representative of a government and those governmental interests, and then also being a whole being um, with relationships and care and motivation and purpose for being um, engaged in that work within the UN climate regime. Um, with that, I'd like to bring the conversation over to Dr. Titimir. Um, as we're considering um, the role of faith-based actors and in interfaith engagement, um, in the climate talks um, and in global climate policy. Dr. Titimir, I'm wondering if you could help um, shine some light um, on the processes underway um, within the climate talks and particularly if you would like to draw out some of what came forth in COP26. So that can help us frame and consider areas of strategic engagement for, through the faith-based lens. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Emily. Am I audible? 
Okay. Yes, you are. We can hear you. Thank you. Thank you, ICE Network, for inviting me to join in. So when we talk about Glasgow, I would like to really reverse that. I want to talk about Gabura. On one side of Gabura is the turbulent Kolpetua River, and the other side is the strong current-driven Koputakko River. Cyclones, tidal surges, floods are constant companions of the people of Gabura. Due to the continuous erosion of the river, this town is getting smaller and smaller. Two cyclones amidst the COVID-19 struck the coastlines in Bangladesh with the waves of the sea take the form of a monster. Roads, houses, croplands, fields, shops were washed away by the tidal waves. Many people died, millions rendered homeless. So after the cyclones of Cedar, Isla, Bulbul, Foni, Ampan, and Iyas in Shatkira and Khulna, the ancestral Vita or home states have gone into the riverbeds. Many are forced to leave the seven generation Vita and they have to take shelter on the embankments. Almost every year, embankments get broken and the localities are flooded. So the severity of the disaster is increasing day by day and the destructions are accumulating. The science is now in agreement with the experiences of the people, including those of Gabura. The sixth assessment report of the IPCC paints a picture of the plight of the world's climate endangered people, including Gabura. According to the IPCC report, climate change will increase the incidence of cyclones, tidal surges, and floods in Bangladesh. So thus, there are all kinds of natural disasters that the world has not seen in the last 2,000 years. The report warns that the situation is now spiraling out of control. Rising temperature has a relationship with increased propensity of cyclones, tidal surges, and floods. So after the Industrial Revolution, the global temperature has risen by 1.1 degrees Celsius. And during this period, the Indian Ocean has become more heated. As a result, the monsoon winds are getting stronger and causing more rainfalls. And that is why floods are increasing along the banks of the river. So the United Nations Con uh, Convention, uh, Framework Convention on Climate Change says that even if the countries that have already submitted nationally determined contribution achieve their commitment, it would take light years to achieve the goals of the Paris Agreement, carbon emissions must be reduced by 45% by 2030. So amidst this, there are glaring disparity in energy consumption between rich and poor countries. For example, per capita electricity consumption in USA is 12,990 kilowatt hour, while in Bangladesh, it is only 320 kilowatt hour, while Bangladesh contributes only 0.30% of global emission of greenhouse gases. Yet, it is probably the most vulnerable country to climate change induced extreme environment events. If you are looking at a recent post-26 COP26 study by CZD, which highlights the vast energy inequality between the rich and poor countries and found that East Britain produces 200 times the climate emissions of the average Congolese person with people in US producing 585 times as much. The elevation of two thirds of Bangladesh is less than five meter above sea level. A mere 50 centimeter sea level rise will inundate 11% of land mass and displacing an estimated 15 million people. The disparity in consumption of energy between rich and poor countries must be addressed if we want to have a real solution to this looming disaster. The rich 
countries must be convinced that maintaining a high energy consumption based lifestyle is not sustainable. And then, although not responsible for climate change, Bangladesh is one of the most affected countries. Added to this is an increased pressure of the forcibly displaced Rohingya population of Myanmar. More than 6,000 acres of forest have been destroyed since Myanmar's 6.5 million displaced Rohingya crossed the border in 2016. Soil, water, forest, biodiversity are under great threat. Mr. Olok Sharma, the, the president of the COP, visited Bangladesh and he said Bangladesh is at risk due to climate change. I have visited the Shundarbans, the largest mangrove forest in the world, and seen that many people in Bangladesh are living in that area at risk. Millions of people in other parts of the world are also at risk. They needed to be helped, unquote. But Mr. Sharma's efforts to provide adequate funding for the affected countries is yet to be noticed. Sustainable use of natural resources must be ensured without hastening the destruction through arbitrary extraction. Above all, the production system must have to be sustainable, green, and ecology friendly. It is important to get out of the life destroying system and preserve the natural ecosystem, forests, rivers, etc., by emphasizing on the balanced relationship between human beings and nature. In this regard, there is no substitute for global cooperation, partnership, and above all political goodwill if we are to achieve the sustainable development goals. Three decades of progress have been washed away by COVID-19 and widening inequality is further exacerbated through vaccine nationalism. I can go on the issues if in the next section in terms of decisions on fossil fuels, then secondly, the unbridled commitment and lack of implementation in financing, then adaptation, which has been kept for Sharm al Sheikh, then the, the mm. old, very important issue, the old strategy of avoiding responsibility, meaning touching on the CBDR principle, the common but differentiated responsibilities and respective capacities in the next round. Thank you very much, Dr. Titamir. And I would like to circle back around to some of those decisions and outcomes, um, but I would like to bring, to bring forth to Jill, um, both the framing that we have had from Booty in terms of engagement and faith-based and interfaith engagement at the global policy level and the bridging picture that Dr. Titamir has shown us, really reminding us of the severity of vulnerability in communities, the challenge of loss and damage, of responsibility and accountability, and an, an, an equity within the global framework for representation and um, for responsibility and funding, adaptation, mitigation with, ad um, with adaptation in those spaces. And we turn to you, Jill, and we look at the work that you have been doing in community development and across Myanmar, across Asia, and um, working through spirit and education movement, working um, through INEB. I'm hoping that maybe you could share with us your perspective on um, some of the most effective ways to address this vulnerability in local communities and across regions. Thank you. Jill, you are muted. Well, th through our INEB network, International Network of Engaged Buddhists, as Kalyana Mitra or spiritual friends, it's a very strong network of um, listening to the suffering of people in countries because most members are in Asia, listening to the stories and uh, seeing how to, how to respond. And at our yearly conferences up until two years ago, 
We, it's been an opportunity to hear that and to visit and be involved in some of these projects. <clears throat> For example, in Sri Lanka, just a few years ago, um, ICE Network organized a meeting with interfaith leaders and with politicians to see how, what ways might be able to respond to the global crisis, how to bring um, a different approach through religious leaders, bringing um, shared religious values, values that put humanity at the centre uh, rather than economic development. Um, <clears throat> what came out of that was the recognition, the need for some training for some of the religious leaders. I mean, in many countries of Asia, as our participants here, um, who might be really talking about this, but at village level, there are whatever the different religions, there's a lot, lot of, um, they're the leaders and people who are respected. So play an important role in terms of educating and you know, potentially advocate advocacy at that level, bringing people together, voices together to hear the voices of the most vulnerable, um, to work towards some paradigm shift um, away from consumption. Um, <clears throat> and you know, to, to see our common humanity. In Bhutan, the Gross National Happiness Conference um, that ICE members and INIB members, some members attended uh, just a few years ago, <clears throat> me, was an opportunity to be able to hear um, of work, me, programs such as in Vietnam, livelihood and sovereignty um, projects where communities, uh, community, this common land is shared and supporting each other in that community, which has been a, as a barrier to corporations coming in and picking off individuals buying their land. So it's a way, and these communities, which we visited after the conference, you know, growing into planting of, of um, many different uh, species for, for health and medicine, as well as food. So self-reliance um, is an important part. And I think overall, you know, through, through many different examples of small groups, uh, small organizations, civil society organizations inter and interface groups coming together, uh, being a support for each other, nurturing each other, and um, yeah, to encourage some transition. Just one, one other example, in Myanmar just a few years ago, um, there was someone developed a set of cards uh, with images of different scenes in, of life in Myanmar, scenes like um, a well drying up, displacement, another scene of displaced people because of the large gas and, pipeline, gas and oil pipelines going through the country. Uh, another one of people leaving the land because of drought and so have going to cities and not having work. So people were, received a training of just for a day to then go back to their villages and use these cards as a, and to show that people could identify different one, identify with different ones and to come together to see together what are the common problems and address those together. So starting very much from grassroots. Perhaps just another brief example is through the work of Joanna Macy is from the States, but she has worked in Sri Lanka a lot and learned a lot from the Shramadana movement of cooperation together. But her, her work is um, of um, acknowledging, sharing the pain and feelings for what is happening um, is a basis for transformation. First of all, coming from gratitude, asking, um, <clears throat> You know, what is it in life that you love? And which is a key point to be able to, when people find those, those aspects of things that they love uh, in, in nature around them, they're more likely to protect them. Just as like um, from, from Australia, an example uh, of meeting with Uncle Max, who unfortunately died just a few months ago, but he took, he would take some of us into sacred places and he was a living example he was an example 
of living respect for all of life, not just for human beings. Um, and um, there's, there's, yes, perhaps I would just leave it at that and uh, may come back to more later, later of those and aspects. That, that was a really beautiful um, raising up of, in, in a way, a reminder of why we are all here. Um, you're speaking not only to um, recognizing our mutual capacity and our agency work together to, to sit with the suffering and the harm that we are all experiencing to varying degrees with climate change and ecological crises, but you're also moving that, um, moving the question to, into the space of love and care and compassion. Um, what is moving us in this work? And with that, I would like to um, come over to you, Philip, Bishop Huggins. Um, it, we'd, I'd love to hear from you about what has moved you to join in work in the global climate regime, to be present as a faith actor in interfaith spaces um, at the COPs and around the, and around the climate issue and to share further um, activities that you have undertaken in Australia and globally around climate change. Thank you. Thank you, Emily, and thank you for this opportunity and thank you to the, those who've spoken so beautifully and eloquently uh, before me. <clears throat> yeah, I think as Jill said, and as you just said, Emily, um, it's what, what, what we love is what um, sustains us and motivates us. Uh, so I, a couple of years ago, finished um, a, a large piece of work and reached a place uh, where I could choose what I would do next a bit easier. And um, what I decided was I'd only do things that really would benefit my uh, grandchildren's generation. Uh, they're all under five. And so clearly um, to be involved in preventing catastrophic climate change, all of the sorts of things that we know are the already taking place and will even more if we don't contain the rise in global temperatures, if we don't finalize the Paris Agreement, if we don't fulfill the Glasgow Climate Pact. Um, so therefore out of love for all of creation, but in particular personally for these little grandchildren and their generation, uh, I became involved. And I'd just like to say two things. Uh, going to the COP that was ended up in Madrid, I didn't really know what I was going to. Not the first time in life I haven't known what I've been going to. But um, what I found there was, and this was the 26th or 25th, an amazing group of people a extraordinary document, the Paris Agreement that had been shaped over a number of years, um, a, a possibility of multilateral cooperation in an era that hadn't been friendly towards multilateral cooperation. And yet at the same time, a culture that had shaped, that made achieving what is needed Problem, at least problematic. Cultures are funny things. Essentially, a culture of an organization is the history of relationships between people. And a certain kind of ethos evolves by the way in which people relate to each other over a period of time. And it becomes a culture, either healthy or unhealthy. And the COP had all, has all these um, people who know really what's happening to the planet very intelligent, gifted people, but the framework is the rivalry, nation state rivalries, and the um, continuing influence of powerful lobbies uh, for whom delaying significant climate action um, facilitates their ability to continue to exercise their business. So um, the culture is mixed, but I see the role, and here to the second point, 
I see the role of people of faith as being to um, help cultivate a, a healthier culture, one where there's that uh, appreciation, that gratitude that's been spoken about by some of the other speakers, uh, that, that love that's in our hearts is evident in our, um, in our demeanor and our action. And, um, and that makes, makes the difference to a culture that it, if we're to achieve what we need to achieve, it can't stay adversarial and it can't stay transactional and it can't stay with blind spots to continuing powerful influences that will not allow us to accomplish the, the Glasgow Climate Pact. So there's a, a strong edge to this, but there's that need to, for people of faith to practice um, a way of relating to one another that's full of faith and love, and at the same time is clear, very clear about what the consequences are of our actions. A great Buddhist teacher, 95 years of age, died last week, I think, and um, he keep, kept reminding us, pay attention to our breath, was honouring him that I spoke in our little meditation as I did. Uh, but also he said, you know, we're the sum of our actions. And, and so we, you know, our task as people of faith is both to take the actions that are going to be full of love for our planet, but also to encourage people to see that they will become the sum of their actions. And if they want to be part of a generation that prevents catastrophic climate change, this must be attended to. Thank you, Bishop Huggins. And um, as uh, Zen Master Thich Nhat Hanh has said, only love can save us from climate change. And he has also been written, he has also written basically a suggestion that the global climate talks um, were a bit like chickens fighting in a coop <laughs> and not seeing the flood about to come in. And on that note, I would like to draw what you ended your, um, your notes, um, Bishop Huggins, and bring that to Booty, Jill, and Dr. Titimir as well. Um, when we're considering the a global climate regime that has been established um, in a zero sum game theory model of power dynamics and who will win and who will take responsibility. And we're talking about um, entering into these spaces in this work from a point of love and compassion, from a sense of justice and ethics, from the championing of a 1.5 degree cap when we're already, as Dr. Titman pointed out, at a 1.1 degree post-industrial climate um, temperature rise. Um, what does it look like? Where are the strategic points that interfaith and faith-based actors can enter in to the global climate regime to make a difference? Can they? Where is it that we need to work? And I know those are enormous questions, but I'm going to ask each of you to give me two or three sentences and starting with Booty. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I think your question is very, very key because at the same time, I mean, we understand that the decision-making process sometimes is considered as uh, going toward, you know, the, the extreme. Uh, and sometimes we are afraid. I do feel afraid, like Bishop, uh, uh, Bishop Philip mentioned about the granddaughters. I don't have any granddaughters. I don't have any children, but I do feel uh, afraid of what will be the result of this uh, uh, decision making process that sometimes is a bit scary. At the same time, as people of faith, I think we, uh, what we are trying to do in Franciscan International and Franciscan Network is really to uh, really use, uh, go back to our sacred text, uh, to our uh, the, 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 the teaching of our faith and religions. And this will uh, speak uh, much more because uh, we are now trying to uh, encourage people really to uh, have a personal conversion. Eco we call it sometimes ecological conversion, that each of us has the responsibility 
we are quite blessed to have the teaching of the Laudato Si, and Laudato Si speaks a lot for us, and it has been used very widely in our network as a call, as a call that we should make a confession. We have to make a, a, a change, life, lifestyle change. Each of us has the responsibility. So that's for us as a, a, the departure point that yes, each of us can do, uh, can uh, make uh, our planet better. Uh, at the same time, uh, we also work really to knock the door of all these decision-making uh, uh, process in different levels so that uh, not only us, but they also uh, need to change. So that's uh, the two sentences from me. Thank you. Thank you, Budi. Dr. Titimir, I'm going to ask you the same um, strategic inroads or if you want to draw the outcomes, um, where are the points of impact and influence that interfaith communities might have? Um, within global climate policy? Okay, thank you. It's very difficult to answer your question without really looking at the technicalities because the small prints matter and everyone hides behind those small prints. But I'm sure we would get the chance to discuss what was the outcome and where it can be, uh, it can be hidden by through what has come to be known as constructive ambiguities. So, uh, but you asked me to make a kind of a two sentence thing. It's very difficult. Anyway, I would try not in two sentences, but a couple of sentences. So it is often said that people in developing countries struggle and they have a special ability to survive what is come to be known as resilience. Indeed, the people of these countries survive by constantly fighting with storms, tidal surges, and floods. But at the global level, the people of developed countries are, in a sense, because I would rather say that, because the, they elect their leadership to avoid this responsibility by resorting to gross misconduct to bypass this plight. In a sense, they have dissed CBDR principle, which is the common but differentiated responsibilities and respective capabilities, is a principle within the UNFCC that acknowledges the different capabilities and differentiated responsibilities of individual countries in addressing climate change. And we have to remember that people are not just numbers. Their struggle and survival are very difficult in any disaster. But yet, I am fascinated by the youth movement for climate justice, for a transformational change since the crisis is systematic. This ignites hope for our common future and a just socio-ecological transformation, encouraging us not to live at others' expense. This is an aspiration for collective autonomy and the self-limitation on the expropriation of nature. Humanity is at crossroads. As said in the beginning, 2022 marks the 50th anniversary of the first intergovernmental conference to address the environment as a pressing issue at a global scale. And the golden jubilee of many issues Today, we face a triple crisis of climate disruption, biodiversity loss, and COVID-19 destroying our planet. And the tipping points are just ahead of us. I would consider this, this next decade will be a, either a breakdown or a breakthrough. Let's make change happen. Let's walk the talk. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Titimir. Um, and, th and that's a very powerful segue that we're coming to Jill as we consider where are the points of transformation and transcendence? What is the role that faith leaders and faith communities and sacred ecology can bring to facilitate, catalyze, and usher in um, a breakthrough, a transformation, so that we do not 
implode within the syst systems of the industrial growth society. Um, Jill, before you give us your few sentences for a very long question, um, I really want to make sure that everybody, all of the attendees, um, that you're preparing to join in the conversation. Um, and if we're going to move into a space where you, sh you bring your questions and your comments, you share your stories and your thoughts, and I'm also inviting the panelists to ask questions of each other and you. So we're, we're moving out of the, uh, the receptive mode into the engagement mode. Um, so with that, Jill, I'd love to hear your thoughts. Through our interface groups, um, and at local level coming together to um, in acknowledging the resilience that um, our last speaker, um, sorry, I've just forgotten his name, last speaker spoke about, um, yes, yeah, sorry, Rashid, the resilience <clears throat> that is there in so many people. I mean, even in Myanmar, where as long with all those other things as war and um, brutality, but um, I think to come together and to ask what, what is the vision? What sort of society do we want? You know, the, a lot of the decisions and discussions and you know, what we see at national levels are incremental uh, decisions to um, fix Band-Aid or fix the problems of um, um, greenwashing, it's called, but it's not looking at the root causes which is a strategy used in the peace building, looking at the root causes as a basis uh, for change, looking at the need for systemic change. It's not, it's our personal, our communal coming together, but also systemic change that is, is necessary. But to, to work towards that change, we need to have a vision of what, what sort of society do we want? You know, is it a collection of in, individuals opposed to each other or, is it where that emphasis emphasizes belonging? And this is where I think feel faith and religious networks are working together and can offer so much our shared humanity and um, working, working to build a movement from the ground up for a movement for shared humanity, um, a movement for humanity with dignity. Um, I mean, the key to happiness um, from a Buddhist perspective, maybe others too, I'm sure it is actually as I think about it, is contentment. It's not about the amount of goods that we have or what we consume. And so to get back to those basics and to, uh, to share together the vision, our vision and in that way through a shared vision, it's building the movement for as action for change at whatever level. Just one other quick point, I think, I'm feeling, you know, coming from the um, first, the wealthy nations, the importance that we have to um, lobby our own governments. I mean, as hard as that is, but I think for, you know, and there are movements, interfaith groups in Australia that are doing that to divestment and uh, to stop the big mining groups. But that's um, a responsibility that we have, seeing those huge um, discrepancies that you, Rashid, um, talked about. Thank you, Jill. Thank you. Um, so, as usual, we are really, um, we're looking into the chasm, but we are building our resilience together. Um, so, as um, I invite Philip, if you have any questions that you would like to pose either to your fellow panelists or to um, the participants and attendees in the program while um, our wonderful working team, Mon and Sun, bring them into the group. Um, I invite you to, if there are any questions you may, you may have that you'd like to pose. Thank you. Um, a, a question with a little uh, reflection brief. Many of us couldn't get to the COP in Glasgow. And so through the Interfaith Liaison Committee, we encourage people around the world uh, to pray and meditate in their own tradition, to gather, be it on Zoom or personally, and just spend 20 minutes in silent meditation. We provided some resources 
uh, that gave people some insight into what the issues are at the climate change talks. And we're planning to do the same again. It, it uh, took off quite wonderfully around the world in the lead up to Glasgow. And in terms of this period we're in now where we're just aware of so much to do and um, so little time, the great wisdom of all our traditions is to pause and pray more and meditate more <laughs> rather than less. So my question really is, can we encourage, is the quality of interfaith life now such and the shared common understanding such that we can cultivate, nurture groups all over the world where people gather and then offer prayer and meditation silently, um, respectfully, silently, uh, in, this, in these next months leading towards the COP in, in Egypt. We know that meditation builds community. Is this not our best contribution in this period ahead? Well, that is, there's something very reverberating in that liminal space of, of prayer and the sacred and the sacred and all being in all, all of our relationships. Um, at this point, um, and we will keep the, the, the threads that are rising up, we will keep coming back to them, but I would like to invite everyone who is here on, on our program today, and I think we have 21 people at least, um, to join in. And um, I have an inv invitation for if there are questions, for the panelists or comments or sharing, sharing of your own experiences. Um, it would really enrich this time together to, to hear from you and see you if possible. Is there anybody? We'll give it a moment. Moderator team, are folks able to, to raise their hands or to write, type out questions? As you're warming up, and I hope you're all warming up and getting ready to really launch into the conversation, um, Rashid, perhaps you could tell us a little bit more about some of the outcomes from this COP26 and what the implications are for justice, for inclusion, for most vulnerable communities. Uh, thank you, Emily, for inviting me to do things which are technical in nature, but I would try to be as simple as visible. So let's really look at the decision on fossil fuels. So US President Joe Biden has called on more than 90 countries to reduce their global emission by 30% through controlling the polluting pollution by methane. But however, we have seen big emitters like China, Russia, India are not included in the agreement. So there is a fog surrounding methane emission reduction as well. As we all know that methane raises the maximum temperature amongst the greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. But what is most important is to understand that carbon dioxide remains in the atmosphere for a long time. So Global warming of 0 0.1 to 0 0.2 degrees Celsius can be avoided by only reducing, not by methane alone. So carbon dioxide is increasing the temperature of the atmosphere by 0 0.2 degrees Celsius every decade. So the emphasis has to be on carbon dioxide amongst the greenhouse gases, but that's not there. Then we have seen that, uh, that there are at least some accounts suggest that by 2030, 6,500 uh, existing coal-fired power plants in the world will have to be shut down if we are to reach that level of ambition. And no new coal-fired power plants can be built. But 
as you have noticed that the Glasgow Climate Conference has placed to phase down. And they have not talked about other fossil fuels such as oil and gas. And secondly, this is another issue there were which really relates to Article 6. So there are jubilation at the establishment of a global carbon market and the approval of rules governing bilateral carbon trading. Under the agreement, 2% of credit transactions under the centralized carbon market will be scrapped in order to tighten the overall reduction in carbon emission. However, the issue of bilateral credit transactions between countries is voluntary, which means that the market system will be used to transfer pollution from one place to another. And that's a critical issue. Then the United States has also rejected a proposal to raise a portion of the revenue from bilateral and voluntary carbon trade to the adaptation fund. And as you have noticed that African countries had hoped for more sources of adaptation money but instead had to limit themselves to the assurance of voluntary contribution. Then if you are looking at the money needed for adaptation to climate change to prevent this use of fossil fuels and for technology to reach at the net zero level. So reliance on fossil fuels can be reduced only through huge investment and structural transformation. But as we know that there were a 100 billion climate fund proposed in Paris. But we know that the proposed amount could not be confirmed and it has only placed over 2021 to 2025. And then if you are looking at developed countries are making places without really effective measures, for example, in the run up to the conference, the host country, the United Kingdom reduced its overseas aid from its earlier committed 0.7% to 0.5% of GDP and renewed oil and gas exploration in the North Sea and reduced incentives to electric vehicles. But amidst this, thank God, a US federal judge has blocked a highly controversial sale of oil and gas drilling leases across 880 million acres of the Gulf of Mexico, ruling that, that Joe Biden's administration didn't properly consider the leases impact upon the climate crisis. The decision handed down by the DC court late on a just Thursday represent a landmark victory for environmental groups that had sued the government to prevent what was the largest ever auction of oil and gas leases in the Gulf history. Simultaneously, thank yes. So, uh, Dr. Smith, thank you. Um, I'm going to, um, I'm sorry to interrupt you. Uh, what you're bringing forth is really crucial for our understanding. I want to also bring this back to some of the attendees who um, are starting to ask some questions, but the key elements that you're bringing out is that the decision makers are still markets, corporations, the determination of how um, net zero will be met is not going to be monitored or regulated, but, but voluntarily determined by corporations. And so what we're really hearing is business as usual in terms of the power dynamics and money agenda of the global industrial um, economic system. So that's very concerning that we're seeing that accelerate and increase in spite of the goodwill commitments that were made in Paris um, at the, and the Paris Agreement. Um, with that, I'd like to bring attention to Reverend Lee, who has his hand up. Um, do you have a question or a comment um, or a story to share with the group? And after that, Linda, we will, um, I see you have a question as well. Thank you. Yes, 
어, 돈과 물질에 포적되어서 어, 풍요를 추구하는 도구가 되었습니다. From now, I, uh, until now, I think, I think the, um, I think the problem of religion was that religion kind of got head and then looked to the capital and seek for um, uh, material wealth. So, so, so. Um, 네, 그런데 이제 기후 위기는 종교인들한테 종교 본래의 가치, 작은 삶, 정신적인 풍요, 깨달음이라는 종교 본연의 가치로 돌아가지 돌아가도록 일종의 강제하는 아주 주, 아주 중요한 아주 좋은 종교적 메시지라고 생각합니다. So I think this uh, climate uh, crisis is a, a great uh, sign for our um, religious leaders to go back to our basics, to our to our um, original uh, originals. 모두 한꺼번에 깨달으라고 모든 전 인류가 다 부처가더라는. So I think um, before, like the Buddha or Jesus, like only few enlightened people was needed. But now, in in this crisis, I think everybody need to be enlightened. 가장 자발적이고 신년 집단으로 조직화되어 있는 것들은 종교입니다. 그렇기 때문에 환경 위기를 해결할 수 있는 가장 큰 NGO도 바로 종교라고 생각하고, 이 때문에 종교가 공동의 행동을 같이 제안해 보면 어떨까? So, and I think this uh, uh, religions are most um, faith-based and very um, autonomous. I think so. So I think in this crisis, if if we can make up this um, uh, agreement or or a common common words, common sentences, I think it will be very very much help. 그런 자본주의 사회, 또 산업 사회인데 어, 지금 모든 종교가 전 세계 모든 종, 종교가 종교가 있는 성당이라든가 절이라든가 교회에서 자기가 갖고 있는 물건 중에서 물건이 본래 가격이라는 것이 없는 것이고 그 다음에 내 것이라는 게 아니다 라고 하는 그런 두 가지 가치 내 것이라는 것은 없다 가격이라는 것은 없다는 가치로 내가 갖고 있는 물건을 갖다가 성당이나 교회나 절에 가져와서 서로 교화라고 나누면서 어, 이 돈으로 돈으로 가치화돼 있지 않은 것들을 서로가 필요에 의해서 주고받는 그런 문화를 만들 만들어서 이게 거대한 산업 자본주의를 갖다 거슬려 나가는 활동들을 해보면 어떨까 이런 제안을 드리고 싶습니다. 조금 발전시켜 보셨으면 좋겠다 싶어요. So my proposal is that how about um, that we we cannot own a thing or there's no uh, price to anything. So F uh, so, so uh, on, on, on that basis, how about uh, 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 my proposal is that in churches or in temples that people can gather and share what they have without any price. So, so that is my proposal. Thank you. Thank you, Reverend Jung Chu. Um, are anybody on the panel um, like to respond to this? this uh, thoughtful consideration of um, the link between religion, faith, enlightenment, and the um, perhaps the co-optation of a particular economic system and the pathways out of that. Any panelists have any? Uh, Budi? And then uh, Budi first, and then Bishop Huggins, please. Thank you. I think very uh, briefly, I, I completely agree that the, the one of the key issues now is that uh, with the current crisis, the response once again is uh, using the economic market system. So this is also one of the problem. We understand that uh, through the experience that the economic market system doesn't work. It doesn't work because it's always creating more problems and going deeper and deeper. So that's why I think now we start to look at the different uh, system or different uh, alternatives to this uh, market, economic market uh, uh, that has been uh, used. And I guess uh, when the Reverend mentioning about the economic of solidarity sharing, it is one of the possibilities that many people are thinking and within our own network as well, uh, using our own teaching. Now we are starting to see what are the alternatives. And I think the more we propose with alternatives, the more we see that, yes, we, we, we need to think outside the box. 
so that we, we should not be always imposed on what we have to do. But we can uh, dig to our own experience and try to see what uh, other, other possibility that might work only at the local level, but it provides uh, alternatives. So I think there, I mean, I agree with that proposal and I think we need to, to, to have more reflection to see what all the alternatives than the one that has been imposed so far to us now. Thank you, Budi. Bishop Hoggins, do you have anything to, to add? Two, uh, thank you, Reverend, for your reflection. Two pieces of advice I've received, I try to practice. One is simpler living, higher thinking. And the second one is from Desmond Tutu, the problems may seem huge, what we can do might seem insignificant. Nevertheless, it's essential that we do it. I find those two pieces of advice helpful as we seek to have more integrity as people of faith. Thank you, Bishop Huggins. Uh, Jill, would you like to add something before we move to London? Just very briefly, thank you for those. <clears throat> I, I would like to take this opportunity uh, to uh, ask the panelists uh, maybe a couple of questions. The first question that I have is, uh, we have the majority of young people are actually placed in a system called schools and colleges. And I, uh, I understand that in many uh, parts of the world, religion or spirituality is not part of the mainstream education. So without educating our young population on the, all these issues like the climate change, pollutions, whatever, all the issues that we have, uh, and, and in one way through this forum, the faith-based organizations are trying to uh, come up with certain measures and recommendations. But my question here is how as paid with organization are you able to uh, educate our young people in the schools? What are some of the strategies uh, are you all taking to uh, do that? That's the first question. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Linda. Um, Jill, would you like to take that? <clears throat> well, I, I, yes, well, thank you, Lundup, for, for the question. I think it's a very important one. Um, here in the West, there seems to have been a decline, um, yes, in religious education, but I think that some schools, there's more emphasis on ethics, but that's not something I'm so familiar with. I'm sorry to say, but I do see that in the different countries I've worked with in the Asian region, including working with the government in exile of Tibet, just how important the religious values are that are, that are taught in schools to be able to... Um, and one sees that in Myanmar, for example, even if people don't meditate, they live the, the practice of generosity, they live, live uh, joy. They, so there's an inculcation of those values. And I think that we, you know, we have much to learn from the West. We have much to learn from countries in, in Asia, uh, whatever the religion are, the way people actually live, live the, those traditions. I'm, that's not an answer, but just a, a recognition and appreciation of how much we can learn from many of you here and your countries. Thank you, Jill. Um, and I, I just, I want to remind everybody and folks here, some people have been with the ICE Network for many years and some have not um, for, some, some have come in at different stages, um, but most of us have been working in some way um, through faith to engage in new systems markets, um, addressing ecological regeneration, renewal, um, rights and well-being, education, and so you're all bringing stories and examples 
to the table. And part of what we want to be positing with you um, as we're coming back together in this time is the question of how do we want to leverage and um, strategically engage the work that we've been doing and what we can learn and create together um, across the local, regional, through the network and through the uh, UNFCCC COP spaces. So those are, I'm hoping that we might be able to extend our program a little bit further tonight because we have two more questions. And we also had in the chat space, um, the, the uh, four questions that were posited, maybe Mon, you could post it again into the, um, for everyone. Um, the questions that we want everyone to consider in terms of where are we going from here and how are we gathering up our experience, our work, our relationships um, to, to move our interfaith engagement further um, at all levels within the climate, climate action. So with that, um, there had been a raised hand with um, Hassan and then Rashid, you also had um, your hand raised. Hassan, are, do you still have a comment or question? Hassan, you are muted. Are you able to unmute? Um, Mon, are you able to unmute Hassan? No. Okay, if you're able to type it in the chat, please go ahead and um, write either your comment or question in the chat. In the meanwhile, um, Dr. Titumir, you had a comment or question. Uh, thank you. Uh, this is, these are the very important questions that were raised. And it's also about making actions. And, and, and I really like the idea of those questions because people are interested to act. I would just flag a very simple issue. We are passing a kind of an epoch where there are also what is come to be known as divisiveness as well as misinformation as disinformation, particularly in certain countries where these are also done in the name of faith. So it's really important that if the faith-based community is also engaged in unpacking those as well as responding those to some what has been known as conspiracy theories. So it would be really, really helpful in the sense that particularly those discourses are coming in Western societies and importantly in USA, so that these issues that are raised in the name of religion in terms of divisiveness with regard to climate change would be really helpful. So I would really request the organizations to ensure that they are unpacking and as well as proactive information so that people get really behind not behind the alternative facts, but behind science. That would be my kind of submission to the network. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Titimir. Um, I'm, I'm hoping I am understanding. Um, I hope that we can maybe push a little five minutes or so beyond our planned endpoint. If there are any other people who have not spoken, who would like to sp speak. Um, uh, um, yeah. uh, if we could make sure if Hassan is able to speak or join, there seem to be a few more people with questions who have not asked a question yet or made a comment. Um, Yeah. Okay. And so Barua, do you have a question or comment to make? Apologies. Just want to make sure that we can have as many voices come in to this space as possible. Um, I'm permitting talking. So if you have been 
gotten a, a note to say that you are able to talk and you have something to say, um, you are invited right now, please. I think we might have some technical issues because I do see um, seven, six people who have their hands raised to ask a question, but it's not showing up. Um, if you can write it in, okay, um, then yes, um, then I think we'll go ahead with um, Jungil, if you do have something that you'd like to add, and then we will wrap up our conversation. And I apologize if there's anyone who's tried to speak and has not been able to. Uh, 어, 종교 밖을 향해서 어, 기후 위기에 대응하기 위한 현실적인 효과적인 정책의 필요로 여러 가지 감시하고 압력을 넣는 일이 첫 번째일 것이고요. 두 번째는 우리 스스로가 어, 기후 위기를 극복하기 위한 삶의 자세를 갖다가 갖게 마, 만들고 그렇게 추진해 나가는 것이 굉장히 중요한 일이라고 생각하고요. 마지막 세 번째 제가 강조하고 싶은 것은 전 세계에 있는 모든 종교가 자기 종교를 성당이나 교회나 절을 산업사회 자본주의에 포섭되어 있지 않은 거룩한 성소로 만드는 운동을 하지 못할까. 그래서 이 안에서 정말로 호혜적인 거, 그, 그 구입하지 않고 서로 교환하고 그래서 이쪽에 어떤 물질적인 어떤 그 교환이 일어날 수 있도록 그래서 일단 가난한 사람과 부자가 없이 갖고 있는 물건들을 서로 교환하면서 이 자본주의 산업사회의 어떤 이쪽에 어떤 성소를 만들고 yes. uh, I think, I think, um... I think uh, our interfaith community can can do three things. First, is I think can uh, pressure and surveil do surveillance on the uh, outer outer uh, interfaith community, like for, for example, market. And then, second, I think we can um, we can make our um, we can we can make our own culture of of overcoming this climate crisis by doing our our own um, cult, our own cultural heritage thing like like meditating and everything so and third I, th I think what we can do is that as I have said earlier that we can make this sacred place our church or our temple and then where we can where we can uh, seek for uh, alternative uh, economical systems so as I've said before like um, uh, trading things without any price uh, in, in title so I think I think uh, we as a, um, a religious community can do these three things. And some of that. Thank you. So those are some very clear pathways to engagement and reminders for us all. Um, well, we have reached 30 minutes after the hour and really want to respect everybody's time. Um, so before I hand this over to Jung Hee, and then we have our closing prayer. Um, I just want to thank everybody for joining today. And um, I'm very moved. I was excited to be able to make this connection with ICE Network after such a long time being away from each other. I dream of a day when we can sit under a tree together and share food and work together and pray together. Um, and now we have the miracle, although imperfect, at least in my use of it, of technology that we can at least connect here. Um, there were several questions that were asked that ICE Network would like to know about in terms of how we would like to move forward as an interfaith community um, with climate talks and with our direct action and leveraging the network. So I would ask that you please, if you have responses that you share that via email with Jung Hee and we will be sure to continue this conversation. Um, so it's with gratitude and uh, great love in my heart for all of you that um, I say thank you and good night from Hawaii as I pass this on to Jung Hee. Thank you. Well, thank you, Emily, for your wonderful job today. Uh, thank you, everyone, for taking time. Actually, in South Korea, today begins, uh, you know, with... Uh, holiday holidays because you know we have used a lunar calendar so <laughs> lunar new years uh, uh, begins uh, a couple of uh, days uh, later uh, especially thank 
thank you uh, panelists uh, for sharing your valuable uh, insights and wisdom from your religious background. I really <laughs> wanted to share uh, something with you, but uh, we have limited time today. So we are going to make uh, opp a different opportunity to talk with you another time. So for uh, closing the uh, forum, uh, let me share a couple of things about activities that ICE Network has done last year and also is going to do uh, this year. So first, uh, we have supported people of Taku Islands, which is uh, submerged by um, sea level rise. They were displaced uh, to the bigger islands now, so we have supported, we have started supporting them uh, last year. And a second thing is that uh, we are providing training program. So let me share the image, just a minute. Did you see the image? It's a little bit too small. <laughs> so, so we are going to provide interfaith climate justice and uh, regeneration training from uh, this coming April to early June. So we are going to have a training once a week uh, for seven weeks. So it is supposed, uh, sponsored by uh, Franciscan JPIC family in South Korea. And also we work together uh, to host this training with uh, co-organizers yeah, towards Organic Asia, Bhutan Soul Farmers, ECOB, and Atisha Dipanka Peace Trust Bangladeshi and Lutbury's Ecosystems. So th this program is for free for uh, any uh, religious people and also civil society activists. So you can check the image after I yeah, share this image with you. So please, please recommend Reverend or uh, venerable monks or uh, young religious activists or uh, civil society activists to us, then we can uh, include them uh, in the training program. Please do so. So now we are closing with a prayer. The prayer will be led by Brother Alusio Kim. Alusio, please. Yes, thank you, Jung Hee Min. So I hope that we can gather our hearts together through the closing prayer. The title of the prayer is uh, Prayer for Our Common Home Earth, written by Pope Francis. A prayer for our earth, all powerful God, you are present in the whole universe and in the smallest of your creatures. You embrace with your tenderness all that exists, pour out upon us the power of your love that we may protect life and beauty. Fill us with peace that we may live as brothers and sisters, harming no one. O God of the poor, help us to rescue the ab abandoned and forgotten of this earth, so precious in your eyes. Bring healing to our lives that we may protect the world and not prey on it, that we may sow beauty, not pollution and destruction. Touch the hearts of those who look only for gain at the expense of the poor and the earth. Teach us to discover the worth of each thing to be filled with awe and contemplation to recognize that we are profoundly united with every creature as we journey towards your infinite light. We thank you for being with us each day and encourage us, we pray, in our struggle for justice, love, and peace. Thank you very much, all of you. Yeah. 
the end of the closing prayer. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Yeah, thank I'll see you. you next thank time. You. We will invite you again. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so thank much. You. Thank you. Yes, okay. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you.